so excited. I understand I have 30 minutes to talk, so about a third of Jim's usual preaching time. Uh, those who know me know that this is mighty early in the morning. Y'all like to get up early. I'm not a morning person. I had a little trouble getting up today. If any of you ever had that feeling where uh, you feel a little bit like you've been hit by a Mack truck? <laughs> I feel like I've been hit by a Volvo and an international and a very large Toyota Sequoia SUV. Uh, for the last 212 days, I've had trouble getting up. And this is my semi-tragic story. That's depressing. So let's go back. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there. I own a company called Let's Pretend Entertainment, and we travel all over the country performing shows, mostly at fairs and festivals. I don't know if you can see those pictures there. I train actors. We work with kids from the audience, about 30,000 kids a year. That would be just a few in one of Jerry's classes. And that picture to the upper right there, that is taken at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo last year, which is where I was trying to get to this year. There's some more pictures of me performing at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. I basically play dress up for a living. <laughs> My job's better than your job. <laughs> People pay me for that, crazy. Yes, we do a lot of other things as well. We have interactive exhibits. I design kids' areas. I've been doing this for about 20 years. And we have multiple units of trailers that travel all over the country. That trailer that you see on the right is the one that I had hitched up to my truck headed to Houston. Now, my family is used to this. Everybody always worries about my family and my family when I'm on the road. So they are used to the fact that I travel five to six months out of the year. I'm not saying they like it, they're just used to it. That picture on the left was taken of me and my husband, Steve, when we went on a cruise right before the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo last year. Obviously, I should have done that again this year. <laughs> and that picture on the right is of my kids there's Sarah, the youngest, and Zach, our oldest. Sarah's a freshman, Zach is a senior, and Alex is a sophomore. Uh, the boys go to Emerald Ridge High School, and Sarah goes to Ferrucci. That picture was taped on the wall in my hotel room. Uh, hotel, listen to me. <laughs> I like to be positive about it. <laughs> my hospital room. And I looked at it every day. And many of you know my parents, <laughs> Al and Becky Sullivan. That's a little awkward. How about this one? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know why they're trying to feed wine to the baby. <laughs> it's not really a Baptist thing to do, but we'll work with them. They're standing in that picture on their 50th anniversary in their house right next door to mine. Well, they did live next door to me until I got in the hospital and then they moved. <laughs> we like to think they're nice people. <laughs> but in that picture, they're standing in their kitchen, which is where they received the phone call and Steve received the call and walked over to their house that their daughter was likely dying in a hospital in Wichita, Kansas. And that's my home. I designed that house. I love that house. And on 
February 27th, I left that house. Rolled out of the driveway. My dad pulled up just in time for me to jump out and give him big hugs. We even caught it on videotape. Unfortunately, that camera was in the truck. But I, I left home, headed for Houston. And on Friday, June 13th, I finally made it home. When uh, that picture was taken in my entryway, which would be tremendous joy, right after that big smile, I broke down sobbing. And all I could say over and over and over was, I made it. I made it. I made it. It was quite a journey. 2,451 miles was the plan. It's a long drive to Houston. And right at the end of February, there was some weather to contend with. And this is not unusual for us in our company. Normally, we're traveling in the summertime, but sometimes we have to travel in, in inclement weather. It's OK. Uh, I got as far as that. You can see that little panhandle. Point here if I could turn without my earring smacking the mic right just across the border into Oklahoma. On Friday, February 28th, 35 hours before the accident, having no idea what was coming on the horizon, I posted this photo. And I'd like to share this verse with you because I think it's pretty appropriate. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. I also texted my husband the day of the accident, and he still has those texts. And I said, I'm going to take the wheel he says, that bad, huh? Roads are icy. I'm sure we'll be fine. But better me in control if something goes sideways. And he says, true. But don't go sideways. <laughs> and I said, not planning to. Smiley face. We have a lot of plans. Anybody ever planned your life out? <laughs> a year ago, I had actually typed up a five-year plan. My sister's laughing because I really am that OCD. <laughs> <laughs> I like to be in control. That's why I'm the boss of the company. That's why they all actually call me boss lady. That's why there is a cardboard cutout of Queen Elizabeth in my office. <laughs> Life size. <laughs> I'm taller than she is. I like to be in control. And on March 1st, I got a lesson in how not in control I really am. Be gracious to me, O oh God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you, and the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. So March 1st, a day that changed my life, I took the wheel. I'm glad I'm d I did. I would never have it any other way. With me, I had Megan O'Dell, who we call Mo. 
She was sitting in the passenger seat, and behind her was Joy. We just picked her up, brand spanking new to the company. <laughs> what a welcome. We just stopped in Wichita and picked her up. And it was snowing lightly. It wasn't a blizzard. But it was snowing and it was really cold. And it was about 7 o'clock at night it, when I picked up Joy in Wichita a little before that. About an hour south of Wichita, my trailer started to swing. Now, I don't know if you have pulled a trailer, a bumper pull trailer, 16 foot. I've had it swing before it happens. But this time it really started to swing. I was in the right-hand lane of a two-lane highway headed south. We had the trailer swing to the left. I pulled over into the left, trying to steer into it to bring that trailer in behind me. And my thoughts, I was very calm. My thoughts were on a couple of things. Don't hit anybody and don't flip this truck. So that happens a lot. If a trailer will swing and all of that force and momentum, some physics at play here, We'll take that truck and roll the whole thing. So we didn't hit anybody, and we didn't roll that truck, but we did jackknife and come stuck against the center median on the left side of the highway there. So two lanes going south, grassy median, two lanes going north, and we were stuck there. I tried jacking that truck off that center median so I could pull it out all the while keeping an eye on the mirrors. And I couldn't budge the truck, looked up in the mirror, and I saw the headlights of a semi-truck coming. Now, somebody who drives thousands of miles for a living knows exactly what the headlights of a semi-truck look like and I knew it was going to hit us. I turned to the girls and I said, get out now and run as fast as you can. I have no idea what made me say that. It's not like I thought about it and thought that seems logical. I just knew that's what needed to happen. And Mo looked at me, she double checked, she said, get out. I said, now, get out and run as fast as you can. And I sat in the driver's seat watching to make sure they could get out because it's a Ford F-250, the back seat has the rear suicide doors, and I wanted to make sure that Joy could get out. I watched those girls as they were getting out of the truck, and that's the last thing I remember. Now what happened next, nobody saw where I went. What happened was we were hit by two semis and an SUV. Uh, the order in which those happened, there's a little bit of, of dispute between eyewitnesses and the police report. I was hit and based on my injuries I was not inside the truck when I was hit and based on the picture of the truck I couldn't have been I would have died now I need to borrow somebody can I borrow you for a second I know you told me I could ask you for help so I need you to do something for me uh, let's see here Ah, there we go that looks like a good color for you could, could you just start walking with that all, as far as you can go there? Just, yeah. Keep going. You're doing great. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Huh. Well, so we don't send you out to the street. Why don't you stay right there? 
and I'll just pull it up from here. So the EMT told Steve that I was launched 30 yards from the accident site. Thirty yards. You can come on back. <laughs> yeah. That's a long ways. And I was found impaled on a guardrail. There was a family in that SUV, and their son, who was the same age as Zach, was the first to find me. I was bleeding to death. And then Joy came and found me. The family from that SUV actually took Joy into her car at one point, and they all were praying over me. Shockingly, on a night where there was a hundred accidents in that area of highway due to black ice, an ambulance was able to get to me within 17 minutes of the call. How does that happen? 17 minutes. First picked up Mo, and, and then they got me all of the blood everywhere made my face unidentifiable. I was identified by a tattoo on my wrist. So we took Mo first to a hospital in Blackwell, Oklahoma, and then they drove 65 miles to the nearest Trauma One Center in Wichita, Kansas, as fast as an ambulance could go on black ice. They were giving me blood transfusions along the way, and they had me bagged, which means they were breathing for me with a bag. When I arrived in the emergency room, I was hemorrhaging blood from my pelvis everywhere. I had the left wing of my pelvis right here was sticking out through the skin and broken in multiple pieces not attached to any other bone in my body. But still there. <laughs> Amazingly. Blood everywhere. I had no discernible pulse. Couldn't breathe on my own. My eyes were fixed and dilated, which is one of the defining factors of brain death. One of the other defining factors of brain death is an inability to breathe on one's own. I had a heart rate of 15 beats a minute. Just to put that in perspective, a normal resting heart rate is 60 to 70 beats a minute. If you're an extreme athlete, it could go all the way down to 40. At 15 beats a minute, that's a heart very faintly going Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. That slow. That is a dying heart. The doctors and nurses rushed me into the emergency room to try and stem the flow of blood. They were afraid I was going to cardiac arrest. I was shot with epinephrine. 
they did emergency surgery. The charge nurse in the hospital, Susan, she talked to my parents on the phone that night. She was very kind, but she didn't try to sugarcoat it. She didn't expect me to live through the night. Nobody did. So when she went home off her shift, she thought that poor woman isn't going to be here in the morning. And I still was. The doctors didn't think I would be there. I had surgery after surgery after surgery, about 14 altogether. I had broken ribs, a collapsed lung, my stomach pushed up where my left lung ought to be. My entire hip and backside gashed open, my pelvis, everything shattered in countless pieces. My left leg broken, my left hand broken, shattered. I, I was a broken person. Amazingly, the foremost pelvic reconstruction surgeon in a four-state region just happened to be in the hospital. And within three days after the accident, I was stabilized enough for them to do surgery. Let me see what we have next here. I've already forgotten. I survived the first night and the next night and the next. And this picture where I'm really cleaned up was taken the first week before I was taken off the ventilator. One of the OR nurses named Terry had come out and told my family that after the first surgery, she didn't expect me to survive. And then I had surgery again, and she didn't expect me to survive. And 30 years of watching trauma patients come into the hospital, you, you get to know, unfortunately, who's going to make it and who's not. And I kept surviving surgeries that she was certain I would not survive until finally she came up to my family and she said, I don't ever come out and talk to the families, but I have to tell you, this woman's life is a miracle. God has a plan for this young woman. The uh, Dr. Thomas, I believe, who's the head of the, the trauma center there, came out and told my family, I don't know how, but somehow, time after time after time, we have managed to do exactly the right thing at exactly the right time. If I had arrived in the hospital just two minutes later, I wouldn't have made it. And amazingly, they were able to put back the pieces of my pelvis. Let's see if we can get that going somewhere. We'll get that in a minute. There we go. That's after the first surgery. I have this groovy hardware installed 
This is a more recent x-ray, but it shows you all of the hardware, which is going to make going through airports a kick. <laughs> So when all of that was done, nobody expected me to be able to walk. They thought, we, we can get this woman not dead, step one, but she's not going to be able to walk. And then, just because things weren't challenging enough, I got sepsis in the hospital and almost died again. And because of blood loss and infection, I ended up losing an enormous amount of muscle. So not to overshare, <laughs> it's a little overshare here, but I have no left bum. <laughs> anymore. Turns out you need that to sit on <laughs> or walk or all kinds of things. So now, without the muscle there and in my hip, hardware holding all of the bones together, my family was looking at a fully disabled, wheelchair-bound woman coming home. But they were really grateful that I would be coming home. You may have noticed I walked up here. <laughs> Just making that point. <laughs> so after 35 days, I was able to sit up. It took 35 days to get to that point. 55 days to be able to stand. And 50 more days after that before I could come out of the hospital. But I was really excited. <laughs> you can see there, there's a brace on my, on my right wrist there. That's another small bit of the story, but... Uh, Somewhere along the way in the hospital, I got nerve damage and wrist drop, and my right wrist just hung like that, and I couldn't use my right hand at all. Couldn't move the fingers. Couldn't lift the hand. And I was told it would probably come back, mm, probably, but nerves take about a year to heal. That would be one year. I'm a really impatient person. <laughs> God knows this. <laughs> so by July, I was using that hand. The question now First of all, do you believe in miracles? But why does it matter? Is it just because we pray? A lot of people get prayed for who don't survive. And my family knows, and my husband knows, that had I not made it, it wouldn't be because God didn't love us enough or because we didn't pray hard enough. That's not why. Miracles matter because Jesus told the official, if people don't see miracles and amazing things, they won't believe. We need miracles to believe in God. To believe in his love for us. To believe that we have hope. And I believe miracles are happening all the time, every day. I know because I see them now. 
I kind of get it a little more, that whole being near dead part. But I believe, having been someone who didn't see them before, that we miss miracles all the time. We have opportunity to see miracles. We have opportunity to tell about miracles. If only we would see them. I believe there are four reasons that we miss miracles. And the first one is that we're just too busy being entertained. If you know the story of Jesus turning water into wine, I'll give you the quick summary. Jesus goes to a wedding. They run out of wine. And his mother says, Ah, we need more wine. This is his first miracle. He hasn't, he hasn't done a miracle before, but his mother believes so much that she says, Jesus, we need more wine. And so he turns water into wine. The disciples saw it because they were there. Those who served the wine, who were close and serving, saw it. Nobody else at the wedding saw it. And the host of the wedding, who tasted the wine, said, everyone serves the best wine first. When people are drunk, the host serves cheap wine. <laughs> Who hasn't done that? <laughs> but you have saved the best wine for now. The people at the wedding were busy being drunk. In other words, they were having a party. And so they missed the miracle. How often do we spend our time entertaining ourselves and we miss out on miracles all around us. Second reason, we're too busy feeding our needs. Now, Jesus was with his disciples, and the disciples got very worried that everyone was going to go hungry. And he said, send us to go buy some food for these people, and they're all going to go hungry, and they were kind of freaking out. Jesus, calm down. How much fish do we have? How many loaves of bread do we have? Not enough, not even close. There was over 5,000 people there. So he took the fish, he took the loaves, he said, here, just pass this out. The disciples probably thought he was a little nuts. So they passed it out, and they kept passing it out, and every time they went for more fish and loaves, there was more, and they, how is this happening? And they kept feeding people. The disciples saw the miracle. The people there, who could have asked, but there's no record of that. They were just feeding their own needs. All of them ate as much as they wanted, when they picked up the leftover pieces, they filled 12 baskets. Because God will fill our needs to overflowing. But as a reformed workaholic, I can tell you that most of us scramble like crazy, working so hard to fill our own needs. And in the process, we're missing miracles. Take a breath. Be present. See what's happening. The third reason we miss the miracles is we're too busy avoiding discomfort. Don't want to make me get uncomfortable. Jesus told a story about a friend going and knocking on somebody's door. And the friend grumbling about having to get out of bed to come help. Well, end of the story, and I'm watching the time. <laughs> Thank you. End of the story. 
is everyone who searches will find, and the person who knocks, the door will be opened. As a recently uh, disabled person, new wheelchairs coming soon, I've learned a few things. People don't make eye contact with me <coughs> when I'm struggling. It's awkward. They don't talk to me. It's a little uncomfortable. We teach our kids not to stare. But if they asked me or engaged in a conversation with me, Think of the miracle that would get shared with them. I'm not shy about telling people what happened to me. Do you think there are other miracles waiting out there that you have missed because you didn't want to be uncomfortable? Ouch, that one kind of hurt a little bit. The fourth reason is my favorite. We miss miracles because we're too busy trying to prove we are in control. I may have done that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> I may still do that a little. Proverbs 16.9 says, A person may plan his or her own journey but the Lord directs her steps. We miss miracles because we get so busy with our five-year plan. We get so busy with our idea of this is how it needs to get done. This is how it needs to happen. This is what I expect. that anything outside that, we put the blinders on. That's not part of my plan. Sometimes God has to hit us with a truck to make this point. <laughs> I'm not saying God hit me with a truck, but you get what I mean. That little girl and her mom and dad had no idea what was coming. You have no idea, no matter what age you are, you have no idea what is coming. And if you stick resiliently to what you think your plan is, you will miss the miracles. Me, being disabled for the rest of my life, dealing with illness due to my failed kidneys from the injury for the rest of my life, that is a semi-tragic tale. Any of us missing the miracles that are available to change your life all around you Every day, missing that, that's real tragedy. Thank you. Before you sit down, <laughs> let's turn off Elisa's mic for a second. There we go. Let's pray for Elisa and ask God to do another miracle in her life with her kidneys. What do you think, huh? God, you are the one who has spoken to us today through a woman who has been a recipient of your marvelous grace. Today she has spoken to us, Lord, about miracles that happened to, to us 
that happen all around us. And we are reminded today to open our eyes and to see and to look. And to look into each other's eyes and listen to each other's story as we talk about the miraculous power and grace that's been operative in our lives. So, Lord, today we ask that you would restore Elisa's kidneys to the proper functioning for which they were created. Thank you today, Lord, for her love, for her openness, for her insights, for her passion. And so, Lord, we just thank you. We've been blessed today. And we believe that Elisa is going to bless many other people in the coming months and years with the gospel, with the story of your love that people need to hear. So strengthen her, Father. Go before her. We ask that you would continue to restore her strength. Thank you for her wonderful family, for her three great kids, for Steve, her husband. Fill their home today with a new supply of joy and peace and love within the walls of their home. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.